continue looking here at the heavenly places and uh, what's going on up in them. Um, this morning we're going to talk about the ba battle plan for the heavenly places, part one. And then next week we'll do part two, and then part three, four, five, six. And, uh, no, there's, we'll, we'll just go as, as much as we can. We, we started looking at the heavenly places uh, and looking at them uh, really because that's where we're headed. Uh, Paul says in Colossians 3, uh, 3 there to set our affections on things above. So that's what we were doing. And uh, we started by looking at the four things that we need to be look, uh, rem being reminded of. Uh, the, uh, of the heavenly places. One, they are real. Two, they are organized. And that's what we looked at last week about that structure with the principalities, powers, mights, thrones, dominions, rulers, and every other name that is named. And we looked at that structure, uh, that, that structure, the offices. Then the third part is that they sit today in the hands of the usurper. And then the fourth part is that God does have a reconciliation program. Now, we've been kind of looking at those four, and you know, we saw that they were real and, and structured last time. This time we're going to take number three and four, and we're going to kind of push them together, if you will, uh, talking about the adversary, uh, and he's in control right now, but then God has a reconciliation program, thus the battle plan for the heavenly places. And the reason for that is really starts here in verse 17. Ephesians 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. As we begin to, begin to think about this and begin to consider what's going on in the heavenly places, you know what Paul's praise that you would do? You would have the spirit of wisdom and of knowledge, the revelation and the knowledge of him talking about the Father. You see, folks, you and I, we are to, right now, in time, as we live and as we walk here, we are to have an understanding of how the Father thinks, how the Father of glory, Father of, the, he, he gave birth to, I'm the Father of my children, okay? The, I, I gave them the issues of birth, well, Linda, too. <laughs> she was there, okay? But the, the, thing, but the thing is, is Father, the, 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 the life giver, the Father of glory. We're to know Him. We are to. Uh, we know how He thinks. We know how He operates. How He how He He looks at things. And and what we're doing in all of this is we're spending time learning and understanding how He thinks. And if you want to do that, then you you need to get to know Him. You know, when you spend time with people, you get to know them. You get to know their ticks. You get to know their tells. You get to know different things about them. You get to begin to understand their heart and their thinking. And when you begin to think about the heavenly places and we begin to get to know him, by the way, as we live life today and we get to know him, you know what his thinking does? It usually becomes our thinking. If you're reading three chapters a day through Paul's epistles just in that month, you know, you read them all, you know what, you, you do that. If you read that about a thousand times, you will never think like you used to think. It will fix, it will correct your thinking to think like he does. A thousand times, that's a lot. It's more than three chapters a day, okay, by the way, all right? But see, the thing is, is the point is, is you read him, Romans to Philemon, you get his thinking and his, then the next thing you know, that becomes your thinking process. That becomes who you are. And what begins to happen is, is when you begin to understand how the Father works, how the Godhead works, you begin to real quickly understand this issue in the heavenly places. When we looked last time at the principalities, powers, that structure base, all of that structure there, those offices, we, we didn't look at who's in the offices yet. That's what's coming. We're going to do that in the future. But when you begin to look at the, that structure, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. When you begin to see that power structure, and you go back to verse 10, 
over, flip over across the page there, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And you begin to look at how he functions. And, and we didn't really talk about this last time, but in that structure, you see how God delegated authority. Okay? And you, you see God delegate authority to run the universe in the hands of his people, his creation. He has given the responsibility to bring all, to bring the goal there. Verse 10, 110. He, he gave that responsibility to his saints in the heavenly places, the church, the body of Christ, and into the earth. The, the issue of the nation of Israel. And what you begin to see there is you begin to see that theology's thought process about how God manages is wrong. God, when you think about management, I don't know about you, I've had good managers and I've had bad ones, okay? Usually in management, there are just two styles, basically. There's the micro and the macro, Right? The micro, here, here, he, the micromanagement style says, here's what I want done, and then here's all how I want it to be done to get to the goal. Okay? Every little detail is fast. That's micro, down to the minutia. Then you've got macro. Macro says, here's the goal, just get there. I don't care how you get there. I'll leave the details on how you get there up to you. Just get there. Now, theology says that God is the micro and that he is in control of everything and he's got a plan and he's going to run it the way he runs, wants it run. And you know, that's so far from what Scripture says about he, how he manages things. The Bible says he's a macro. He says, I got a goal, Ephesians 1.10. And the goal is out there in the future to put everything back under the headship of my son, the government structure of the universe. I don't care how you get there, because you're all going to get there a little different. But I want you to get there. Come over to, uh, well, you're in chapter 1 still, right? You see, when he delegated the authority to run, the principalities, the powers, the mights, the dominions, the thrones, the rulers, the every other name that's named, all those governmental, he gave it into the hands of his people. God loves freedom, loves choice. Moses put in, said to Israel, I put before you death and life. Choose life. Duh. But you know what they chose? Death. That's what they chose. Disobedience. You see, God delegates, and when we see the structure where God has delegated the authority to His people to come and to work within the government to fulfill His purpose. Verse 23, He says, which is the, His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. And really, that's what we're going to begin to talk about. The filling it all up, filling all in all. He's put it all under his feet, verse 22, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Do you know that him being our head is to our advantage? That's our advantage. And he says, I'm put all this under his feet. I put all this there so that he could fill it all in all. And he does it with his creatures, with his creation. The creatures are his people, his creation. Over there, come over with me to 1 Corinthians 15. There's a process, 1 Corinthians 15, by which all of this is going to be accomplished. And I'll be honest with you, it's fascinating. I look at the clock and I'm like, I don't have enough time. You know, we need to spend hours and hours, so we're going to do it over weeks, okay? But because... This information is so fascinating in your scripture when you begin to understand the issue of delegated authority. 1 Corinthians 15. And there's a process by which all this is going to be accomplished. 
And what's fascinating about it is he's allowed us to be a part of it and to participate in it out there in the future, but also right now as we learn and as we come to the revelation of the knowledge of him, wisdom and understanding, prudence. I love that word prudence. Prudence is to see beyond, behind, what's going on in the background, what's going on underneath. You know, they would say he has a hidden agenda. Read between the lines. How do you know that? Because you have some prudence about that. But prudence is the end end of the equation where you've got wisdom, knowledge, and understanding first. Then you develop the prudence to be able to see and to be able to understand. 1 Corinthians 15 passage here, verse number 22, for as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man, notice, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. There's an order to it. There's a process to this. Verse 24, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Even the Father, when He shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for He must reign till He hath put all enemies under His feet. Notice there's a process that's going to work out to the end out there where the adversary is completely and totally put down to where He begins to reign, for He must reign till He hath put all His enemies under His his feet. There, he is go- he's going to reign until he completely destroys and, and uh, knocks down, puts down all the rebellion. You and I play a part in that. Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is a powerful tool. It sits in the tool belt of the adversary. Hold on here real quick. Just run over to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 2. You have to understand, death is, a, death is the big hammer that the adversary uses on people, on mankind. Hebrews 2 verse 14, the writer says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is, the devil. And deliver them who, through, notice, fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Do you see what the power of death was? Fear and bondage and worried. So when you come back here to Ephesians 1, as we begin to think about this issue here of him delegating authority, it brings up the issue of of group dynamics. The law of group dynamics It's very interesting to me because it says that you can only know up to 70 people intimately on a personal basis. And in group dynamics with 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 especially like a church, that's why you see most grace churches small. Because the pastor, the leader, has a hard time giving up some of the knowing and knowing what's going on. Because after you hit 70, what begins to happen? About 70 to 90, it's right in there. What begins to happen is, is take a, us here, I have to then delegate and allow someone else to come and get to know you and then report back to me if, if there's an issue. I can't come and be invested. I have to, as group dynamics. Now think about God and the big group he's got going on the body. To run the the government of the heavens. That's what, by the way, that's why you see mega church types where they have a senior pastor and then they've got all these assistant pastors. That's because he can't be everywhere at the same time. That's why those staff meetings that they have every week, he's dictating to them what's to be taught. That's why you would have you can go online. I've done it. I've looked at their material where all of a sudden they begin to produce material and they say, you're going, to read, you're going to read this book this month and teach out of this book. You're going to do this and that. And then they, they go through. Uh, I was reading about marriage classes and marriage stuff that people do or groups do. And literally one group goes through the same marriage material about every six months. 
because it's geared to go six months, and they rotate the married couples through it. And then when they're done rotating, then they become the mentor, and then they do the, you know, it's, it's crazy. But you know what that is? It's delegated. That's the point. And the thing is, is when God, what has God done? He's delegated that authority, and he's comfortable doing it because he knows who you are. There's a process here. Uh, where did I tell you to go? I don't even remember. Ephesians 1. Let's just go back there. <laughs> it's good to, good to go home, okay? Ephesians 1. You see, that order, there's a process. And he, the Lord, oh, the last enemy is death. That's, wages of sin is death. You see, the Lord, he's going to go out. He's going to put down all authority, all rule, all of that rebellion. And what he's literally going to do is he's going to go out and he's going to piece by piece dismantle the adversary. His possessions, his armament. Think about it. He's got an army. And an army takes armament, takes ammo. It takes tanks and ships and planes. And he's literally going to go through, he, he's got a palace. We're going to see here in just a minute. He's got a headquarters, an HQ. And the Lord is literally going to go through and dismantle it all. And he's going to replace and put in and, and install you and I in the heaven. And in earth, it'll be the nation of Israel. So in the battle plan, there's two fronts, if you will. Two things in regarding to the repossession, the reconciling of the heavenly places for us. That's what we're looking at. One, you have the positions themselves. And then two, you have that creature, the creatures that are going to occupy those positions. And we're going to look at the creatures that are there now and, and so forth. But right now, we've got to get this cleaned up. Ephesians 1.22 the principalities, far above all, I'm sorry, verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all, all things under his feet. That structure, the things. He's the head over it all. It's for our advantage. Again, chapter 10, back in Genesis 1, when he creates the physical creation, he's also created the governmental structure that comes in, and it's going to take that cre physical creation, and the, the structure is going to rule it. It's going to oversee it. Job calls it the ordinances of heaven. There's rules. There's regulations. There's all of this stuff that's going on, and then God delegates his authority. So instead of micromanaging it and having a, a set plan, if you will, he's macro. He's, here's the big picture. Here's verse 10. Here's what I want done. I'm going to give you, man, responsibility and, and to carry out that purpose. That's what he said. To, look back there at Genesis 1. Uh, I'm thinking about this stuff, and I should just show you the verse. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 28. You see, he's gonna, he has given some responsibility to some of the creatures to carry out the purpose. And he gave them the free will so that they could carry it out and do it responsibly. And again, in giving freedom, he took a risk. Because he took a risk back there. He gave freedom to man to come and to willingly by choice worship him to come and give him honor and glory to come and to serve him and he took a risk that some were going to do it and some were not going to do it but before he did you know what he knew that they wouldn't do it they wouldn't choose to willingly suffer, serve, sorry, serve and, and honor him. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain before the world began, was already on the drawing books. You see, he, he knew the risk, but he also knew that he had a remedy for the risk. We call that risk management. 
don't we? And that answer was Calvary. He doesn't do stuff just willy-nilly. He's, he's got, what's the ultimate plan? To put it all back under the headship of his son. Genesis 1, notice if you will, verse 28, Genesis 1, 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and what? Subdue it, and have dominion over. You see, subdue, have dominion. Go out there and rule and reign over creation. Man, you're the top of the food chain. Now go do it. That's why he asked Job over there, why can't you control the donkey over there? You're supposed to, but you can't. Why can't you do? Why isn't man able to control the animal kingdom? You're supposed to. Why can't you, Job? I love that. He had to control those donkeys. You know, don <laughs> he picked a stubborn animal, didn't he? Why? You can't. You're supposed to, though. Come over into chapter 2 here. Chapter 2, verse 19. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam, now watch, to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. God brought the animal kingdom to Adam and he let Adam name it. He didn't say, Adam, that should be a lion. Adam, that should be a horse. Shh, quiet. Adam, didn't you read the signpost on your path I've been directing you on? He didn't say that at all. Look at what he said. Middle of that verse. And brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. You know what Adam did? Come back to Ephesians 1. Adam went out there. And he studied the, the lions and the tigers and the cat, that, that feline part of the kingdom. And he looked at that and he said, you know what? That should be a cat. That should be a lion and a tiger and a leopard. Look how fast that goofy thing can run. It's just like seeing a blur, a spot. Oh, it's got spots. Let's call. That's what we're going to call it. And he, but you know what God did? He let man go in his imagination, creative geniuses to look at what, I, I look at that platypus and I go, man, God has a sense of humor. He created such an animal, you know, as a bill of a duck and a flagger of this and a wig of that. And he just threw it all together and said, go. And, but yet Adam knew enough to sit there and say, that's what that is. Follow that? To create, he delegated that to Adam. He let Adam do it. So he comes along and he says, okay, here's my goal. My goal. There's a usurper in the scene, Genesis 3. And he says, my goal now is to bring all of that the usurper has, take, has power. Satan looks at the Lord over there in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 and he says, this power is mine. It was given to me. And I'll give it to whoever I will if you'll just worship me. Remember that, Pat? The temptation of Christ? God says, all that's going to come back, verse 10. I'm going to put it all in one things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in hell. That's why the correspondence between what's happening on heaven and what's happening in the earth we've been looking at over the weeks is so critical. Because what happens here has a correspondence to up there. Now, come over to 1 Corinthians 12, or back to 1 Corinthians 12. There's, there's an issue in all of this, and again, I'm trying to keep talking about us. <laughs> We're going to go into the Old Testament here in a minute. But he's going to take, there's something he's going to do with all the components, all of the parts of creation. In 1 Corinthians 12, look at verse 18. Now, God hath, now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Now, he's been talking about the spiritual gifts. And the spiritual gifts fell, I'm sorry, but on only men. They fell in order, but they fell by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did this, okay? He did it to please him, verse 18. Now, he's going to use the body to illustrate this. And if 
they were all one member, where were the body? Verse 20. But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Look over at verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. We understand what he's doing there, don't we? What has he done with your body? Your hand can't look at your head and say, take me home. I want to go home now. I'm tired of hanging out over here. No, that doesn't work that way. What does it do? It's a piece, you know. When the criminal commits the crime, the right hand doesn't say, hey, I didn't pull the trigger. The left hand did, so I should go free. (laughs) Doesn't work that way. So we understand the illustration here of its one body, yet that diversification there. And that's the wonderful thing about the church, the body of Christ, is the diversification. If everybody was the head, we'd be in trouble. If everybody was the foot, we'd be in trouble. We need all of it to do what? To work together. And in the heavenly places, go back there to Ephesians 1, verse 23, when he says, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all, he's going to take all of the parts of creation and cause the many parts to fit and to function as one. He's going to take what's going on in the church in the heavenly places and what's going on with Israel in the earth, and he's going to make them all work together. And he's going to come along and he's going to make there to be a unity here in this. Not Israel going to the left and the body goes to the right. We all go to the left and we all go to the right and we all stay in the middle. We're working together. Follow that? Now. Come back with me to Psalms chapter 8. In the Old Testament, the the Old Testament believers, Psalms 8 is a psalm of David, they understood that one day the heavens would be fixed, would be made right. They just didn't know how. They didn't know what was going to happen, who was going to do it, other than God would do it. But they do know that the heavens, it's Jeremiah that says you're going to bathe your sword in heaven. He knew there was going to be a war up there in heaven. He knew that, he, Job says over there in uh, Job 15, he says that the heavens are unclean in his sight now. They know that he, and David's got Job on the, book, on the, on the table there when, he's re, when he writes Psalms 8. They know that he's going to fix the heavens. They just don't know how because nobody can go up there because the, Lord, the heavens belong to the Lord and the earth belongs to man. They know that. They understand that. Psalms 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. See what they know? Isn't that that wonderful? Verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, and thou that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. They know there's an enemy. They know there's an adversary. They know there's someone there opposing what God's plan to do. Verse 3, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. David knows something about the heavens, doesn't he? They know that God's going to rule there one day in the future. Verse 4, what is, a, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou hast visited him? By the way, where is man at? Is man up in the heavens or is he on the earth? He's on the earth. See how David was up in the heavens and then he came down to the earth? Verse 5, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. 
Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea. Where, well, didn't we just read that back in Genesis 1, what he told Adam? See, David understands the position, the crown and the honor and the glory of man. The fowl of the air, verse 8, and the sea, and the fish of the sea, and, what, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Where's David's focus, though? The earth. Why? Deuteronomy's already told him, the earth is man and the heavens belong to the Lord. And David is, but he's well aware that the heavens are going to have to be cleaned up. And they're going to have to be taken up. And dealt with, he just doesn't know how, or who, or what the process is. Colossians chapter 1. You see, folks, I show you one instead of eight, as few references as possible. Colossians 1. Because you need to understand that even though Paul comes in and, and Paul's focus is on the heavenly places... God's focus has been on the whole, heaven and the earth. Ephesians 1.10, right? Colossians 1 is where you need to be. There's an order here. Colossians 1 verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, that governmental structure, were created by him. Who created that stuff out there? The Son did. He did. But the verse then says, and what? For Him. All of this was created for His pleasure to accomplish His will. What's His will? Ephesians 1.10. The Father's will. What is it? Bring it all back under the headship of the Son. Verse 17. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And he is the head of the church, of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He's the one that's going to, he's got it all. It, it's by him, it's for him. He, 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 by him all things consist. <laughs> you know, I woke up this morning, I thought it was going to be a bright, sun-shining, hot day again, but it had this overcast. And I'm like, how did that happen? Where did that come from? I didn't hear that on the, I didn't even watch the news last night, but I didn't hear any of that. You know, so you get on the weather map app, and you go look, and you find out about this and that, and you know, he created this wonderful thing called the Airstream, didn't he? And you've got all different kinds, the Gulf, the Atlantic, the Pacific, you've got all these kinds, and you know what? Well, it, he didn't create it, Mother Nature created it. Let's be straight up. No, he created it. Why? To move things and to cause things not, and, to, and have the ability for man to, to prosper and to live and all of that stuff going on. He did all, but he did it for himself. Because what is he going to do one day? He's going to come and sit and reside here. That's the heaven study. He did it all. But who's up there right now? His enemy. The usurper. The accuser of the brethren day and night. So you got a verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Boy, the Father's pleasure. The purpose there in the creation is to fill it up with a host of creatures that are going to honor and glory. Make him the preeminent one. He's the potentate. Better than the potentator, I guess. But he's the, po the head. The Lord of Lord, King of Kings. He's the Lord of hosts. We look over those creatures, a host of them. And having, verse 20, made peace through the blood of his cross. Notice it's not by the blood of his cross. It's what? Through it. You and I, we're justified by. He's going to take that creation out there and through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. 
By him I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in the heaven. Just to make sure you remember what the all things are. Because you know what people do in that verse? They say, see, Satan's going to get saved. All the unsaved people are going to get saved. And they bring up that wonderful heretical, heretic of a doctrine called universalism. And they say, see, he's going to get them. Everybody's going to get saved. So, well, if that's the case, then why did he die? Duh. Well, he had to die because what? It's through his blood. No, man, he didn't have to die then. What's he, all things? The things in heaven, the things in earth. Back to verse 16, the government. What's he going to do? He's going to reconcile it. He's going to bring it all back under his headship. Boy, recon, that word reconciled. Hold on to Colossians 1. Run back to Romans 5. That word reconcile, he's, it's not talking about individuals there in Colossians 1. He's talking about the system. And what is he going to do with the system, all the things? He's, because of Calvary, one of the works of Calvary that he accomplished was the ability, the right, to reconcile all things back unto himself. He is the propitiation. He is the Lamb. He is the Messiah. He is the King. He is the Lord. He is. Why? Because you got Romans 5. Well, you got to look, look over at Philippians 2. Come on. I'm half asleep this morning. My eyes are hurting, but you got to get there. Come on. Philippians 2 9. Look at what he's going to do here. I'm, hope, I'm probably jumping ahead. Nope, not at all. Good. Philippians 2. That's next week's message right now. Philippians 2, verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Wherefore, why? Because of verse 6, 7, 8, 9. What did he just go do? He went to Calvary. He left kingdom, uh, the glory of heaven, the third heaven, the, that, that wonderful re, uh, union that the Godhead has there. And he comes, and he's born of a virgin, and he walks along here, and he became man, but he became obedient to the death of the cross. So wherefore? God, the Father, that's who He is, also hath highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, boy, that's why those old those guys back there in Acts look at Peter and said, you can go preach in anybody, just don't invoke the name of Jesus of Nazareth. They don't like that name Jesus. Why? Because at that name Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when you come over to Romans 5, that issue of reconciling is to change the status or standing of something. It doesn't say forgiveness, which is what everybody says <laughs> that reconcile means. You know how you know reconcile and forgiveness are not the same? Well, first of all, they're spelt differently. Okay? So when you go look them up in the dictionary, guess what you're going to find? They're not the same. Reconcile. Look at Romans 5, verse 10. Here's a great definition of reconcile. For if when we were, what? Enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You see, we were what? Enemies. But then we were reconciled to, to, to obtain His what? Life. What happened to you? You're an enemy. You're ungodly. You're without strength. You're a sinner. You trust Christ, what did He do? He changed your status and made you a son, doesn't He? See, that's a wonderful thing there. The positions of government, the heaven and the earth, are going to be reconciled. And that's the point. They're going to come back up underneath the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a way for that to be accomplished. Come back with me to Numbers 33. See, you thought this Old Testament stuff was just boring. Okay? But the mechanics, 
how, how is this reconciling going to happen? Well, as the case is in Scripture, God demonstrated it before. As in the day of the battle, so it will be over there. And He has already given to us the battle plan, if you will, to come in, the process of where God is going to come in and He's going to reconcile the system. He's given us a look into how that's going to be done in the heaven and in the earth. You with me? Verse 51, Numbers 33, 51. Speak unto the children of Israel. By the way, if you have a Schofield Bible, you have a little heading right at the beginning of that. It says, the law of the possession of the land. And that is exactly what we're going to read here. How was Israel to go in and to possess the land? The law of the possession of the land. Schofield got, he gets one every now and then right, okay? <laughs> Verse 51, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures. By the way, that's, if you look at that and you study that issue of pictures out, that's pornographic pictures that they have in their religious activities that they do up in the high groves that God's told them to knock it all off, kill it all, destroy. Anyway, the pictures and destroy all. You, you just thought por pornography just kind of happened in the last couple centuries. It's been going on since the beginning, okay? Anyway, and destroy all their molten images and quick pluck down all their high places and ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and to the more ye shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer ye shall give less inheritance. And every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth according to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. Notice, the dispossession plan. Notice the mechanism. How is this going to happen? What are they going to do? They're going to get to the land. They're going to go into the land. In verse 52, what are they to do? They're to drive out the inhabitants, aren't they? How do they drive them out? They come in and they destroy all their stuff, don't they? Thank you. I needed to hear your head rattle, okay? All right. Some of you louder than others. Some of you not at all. I'm a little worried. No, what happened? They go in, they destroy everything, don't they? They, verse 53, dispossess the inhabitants of the land, don't they? You see, the mechanism is to go in and to do what? Clean up the land. But then in verse 54, what do they do? They move in. You just don't go clear the field. You go clear the field and then you move into the field. Follow that? So the mechanism here, come back with me to Luke 11. Watch him illustrate this for the nation of Israel. The process has already been given, Luke 11. He, you're going to go in and you're going to dispossess them. You're going to destroy all the, Blow it up, man. Just put on, throw on the TNT and light it, fire, go. First, you're going to dismantle you're going to take apart the enemy's stronghold. And you have to do that before you can restore it back. And then the second component, the second arm, is you've got to go in there and you've got to occupy it. You've got to, you've got to come in and possess it. Luke 11, uh, when I was in high school, I did a lot of reading on the Vietnam War, history buff. And the biggest complaint that usually was across the board is the military would go in and take ground and then retreat and give it all back instead of holding it, moving and advancing. One of the Marine generals, I forgot who it was now, he said, if you'd leave me alone with my Marine Corps, we'll, we'll clean this country up from top to bottom. But they wouldn't, you know, all that stuff. What do you do? You don't just go and defeat the enemy. You keep the ground. You take the ground. 
Now watch Luke 11. By the way, it takes both the dismantling and the dwelling to accomplish the reconciling. Luke 11, verse 20. Luke eleven twenty. 20. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, armed, keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. The strong man, Jeremiah 31, 11, the strong man is identified as Satan, Lucifer. He has bound Israel, they're under captive, and he's trying to get rid of Israel. But notice verse 21, he keepeth his palace. He, he comes in armed. When a strong man armed, he's got his armaments, his armor, his tanks, his ships, his planes. He's got his military, his mites. They're in there and their occupying force is in the, in, in the territory. Palace, headquarters, where the guy lives. You know, you saw old Patton in World War II, and they'd move into a town. He took the best house. But that was HQ. That was where everybody was going to be. Goods. Verse 21 there. His goods are in what? Goods. All his stuff. All that stuff behind enemy, behind the front that he's got to support the battle. You know, old radar in the back. Okay? They're all there, but they're what? They're in peace, aren't they? He's running the show. Israel, the Lord to Israel. Israel, look, the strong man's got you. But now watch the next verse. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all of his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils. Isn't that wonderful? The stronger one. Who would that be? Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Who is, what does he do? He comes in, and what does he take away from the adversary? Everything. And the spoils of war go to Israel. But what is the spoils of war? What did Numbers 33 say you're supposed to do to all this stuff? Blow it up. What are they to go in and dwell in? The land. That's the spoils, is the land. He goes in and he wipes out everything. Verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he's going to make an application now. He walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. You think about the second coming and, the, and all of that going on over there. And he comes down in his second coming in that route. And he is dispossessing the land of all of, of the adversary's armies and armament. He's kicking them out. They're on the run. That's what he, they got no place to rest. They're moving. Verse 25, and when he cometh... He findeth it swept and garnished. He's left the house. The house has been completely cleaned out, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. You know what he does? He says, hang on a minute. I just got kicked out of my house. The house that I've been in, running and ruling and reigning in for a long time here. This is Israel. I'm going to go back. And when the guy got back, when that unclean spirit got back down there, you know what he found in the land, in the house? It was what? Empty. There was nobody there. So you know what he did? Moved back in. He came along, and he just moved right back in. So you know what? It's not enough to clean him out. You gotta, you, it's not enough to dispose of the enemy. What do you got to do? You got to go dwell in it. Occupy it. Now, come over to Revelation 12. Thinking about us. 
God had a plan, has a plan, to dispose of the adversary, to clean it all up, and then to fill it all with the saints of the Most High. He's got a plan to come along and to clean house, sweep it, garnish it up, but to put his people in the place. Revelation 12 and verse 7, and there was a war in heaven. Now we're going to talk about us. There's a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. In the midst of the week, the 70th week of Daniel, there is a war in heaven. And they come along, and they, Michael and, and, the, and the Lord is leading the charge. And they come along, and they clean house. They make the heavens empty. They've dispossessed the adversary. They've spoiled him. Isaiah says he's going to take the heaven, and he's going to roll it up like a scroll, and he's going to shake out the inhabitants. And he goes along, and he sends, verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, and that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Were they cast out? I think they were. He said it like three times. And I heard, now watch, verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. The now, what now? Do you see that word now? That's not the end down there at the 70th week. This is in the midst of the week. And what's happened in the heavens? The kingdom of God has been established where? In the heavens, they have dispossessed the enemy. And now, verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Period. There's a period after them. Who dwells in the heavens? We do. By the way, we're not visiting. When you dwell, what do you do? You live there. It's yours. You know where all the cracks and the creeks and the leaks and all that stuff is. It's yours. We're doing a bathroom remodel right now, and they pulled the tub away, the shower away and all that. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, there's no insulation on that wall. So I go down to Lowe's, tell the guy, he goes, well, this is what you need. So I'm up in there putting insulation. I didn't know it didn't have insulation in there. It does now quite a bit. <laughs> okay. Hopefully more sound deadening, you know, it won't be so loud. But it's yours, you dwell there, you're not visiting. The kingdom of God has been established in the heavenly places, and he has filled it up with you and I, the church, the body of Christ. Come back to Philippians 3 and we'll be done. You see, folks, the reconciliation plan has been laid out and given to us. We go in. By the way, what happens in, on the earth? We'll talk about more next time. But what does he do? He comes back and he dispossesses the adversary in his second coming. Job over there, the end of Job, they're talk, and talking about the Antichrist. Man, Job's such a wonderful book. He, he, he looks over there and he says, he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him talking about the adversary and the Antichrist and, and Israel's out there trying to defeat him. And Job's like, no, you can't defeat him. Only God can defeat him. He made him. <laughs> Only the word of God, that sword, going to do that. So what does he do? He comes down. Think about what's going on. He comes down. I would draw it on the board, but just quicker to say it to you. He comes down in, in the route of his second coming, comes down there across the bottom end, Bozer and Edomita, he's burned all, he's got all that blood up to the bridle of the horse, goes in over there, comes across Jordan where everybody crossed Jordan, puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives for the first time, is their foot on the ground, cracks it open, redoes everything, liberates Jerusalem, hovers over Jerusalem, deliberate, liberates Jerusalem. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the adversary has run. He's on the run. He's defeated. He's weary. And he runs up into the, to the Damascus area. 
gets up on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, and he's hunkered down in his headquarters. And you know who comes a-knocking? The Battle of Armageddon plays out. And the Lord, they meet him on the field in the Valley of Decision. And they meet him, and you know what happens? He's defeated. In Revelation, over there, he says that he binds that false prophet and that beast, and he casts them into the lake of fire. Then he looks at Satan, and he binds him. says, you're in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Get out of here. And off they go. And a whole bunch of other stuff happens in his, <laughs> in his second coming. But for Israel, it's yet to come. Then, that, then he goes in, and the, now the kingdom of God has come to the earth. Israel is set in the place, and then they go out and they begin to occupy the ground. But for you and I, Philippians 3, 20 and 21 becomes so much more than just us getting a new body. Verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's wonderful, but it's according to the working whereby he is able even, notice, to what? Subdue all things unto himself. We participate in the subduing of all things. We are a part of the dispossession of the adversary and the repossession of the heavenly places program, event, we've been given that info now. We've been given the revelation of the knowledge of Him now. And you know what can, bind, you know what can fill our hearts and our minds is thinking about that. And then the last thing you worried about is all this other stuff. You can go do all that other stuff with this on your mind. And that's what Paul's after. Now we'll Pick up and carry on, do part two, because time's up, okay? Just think about, th it's, there is nothing hidden about what's going to happen. Do you realize that Satan knows the end, and yet he's still out there seeking to devour whomever he will? He doesn't give up, and it takes the final destruction of it all for him to realize that he lost. But you and I, we can have victory in that we can see this. We can begin to understand it. We can put the thought process that, you know what, he's going to dispose, dispose dis, uh, dispossess all that up there, and he's going to insert us so that if Satan ever thought about trying to go back to the heavens, he couldn't because the house is full with his body. Okay? All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for the insight that we can have into these matters. And to know that right now is just a little bump on your ultimate plan of glory out there in the future. And we can rejoice that we get to participate in it. We can say thank you for that. And we can give you the praise and the glory and the blessings for everything we say and do. In your name we pray. Amen.